Welcome to season two of Join the Dots. We've spent our careers giving advice on the environment and learned that choices are never straightforward, but that working through the complexity is rewarding. Here, in each episode, we meet someone new who deals with such complexity in a different way. You can find more information about this and other episodes on our website, jointhedotspodcast.com. And we'd love to hear from you on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. My guest today is Dr. Denise Manker. Hi, Denise. Hi, Sabina. So, Denise, we aren't just meeting right now, are we? We've known each other for a long time. Yes, that's true, Sabina. Unfortunately, (laughs) I have to admit that it's been some decades since we were in graduate school together, but it's a pleasure to talk to you today about this podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure to talk with you. So, to start out, what is your field, or shall I say, what are your fields of expertise? Well, for my entire professional career, I've actually been working in the field of agriculture. I have been working in a lot of different aspects of agriculture, and we can kind of unravel that a little bit, but that's the big level field that I work in. So what's your, what are your degrees in? So that's interesting because <laughs> I have a PhD in oceanography, and most people <laughs> that I work with professionally say, what? You work in agriculture? But in graduate school, I was actually doing marine natural products chemistry. So looking at the compounds that are naturally produced by organisms. I started with a biology degree as an undergraduate, and I just became fascinated with the fact that biology really depends on chemistry. Everybody's signaling and talking through chemistry, whether it's plants or animals or or humans. And understanding what's going on with that signaling and the chemistry is really fascinating to me, putting it all together with the biology. So how does that link to agriculture? Well, I originally, my first job after my postdoc was at a small division of a company, a Danish company, actually, Novo Nordisk, that wanted to see if they could use microbes to find new solutions for controlling pests and diseases in agriculture. You know, like I think 70% of our medicinal and pharmaceuticals come from the natural world. If you think about penicillin or if you think about erythromycin, these are microbial derived compounds that we use for medicine. But very little of that was happening in the agriculture field. So the idea was to see if we could have that same concept and look for natural compounds or microbes that could control these diseases. And in that way, we could maybe have a more sustainable approach to farming so that we were maybe supplementing or replacing, in some cases, synthetic pesticides for agricultural production. And how did that go? Very interesting. You know, for those five years I worked at Novo Nordisk, we found a lot of interesting things. And we were getting ready to commercialize some of those things. Some people might be familiar with one of the natural things that's pretty common, which is called BT or Bacillus thuringiensis. And it's used as a natural caterpillar control. And I think it's pretty available in home garden shops. So that was kind of the concept and the business model. But we were doing discovery of new microbes. And we found a lot of very interesting things. But as often happens in business, they changed their direction. They decided to sell that business unit off. And I actually helped with a couple of other scientists start a new company from the ground up. And there were six of us getting venture capital funding to follow this up because we had seen a lot of interesting discoveries. So that company we founded in 1995 called AgriQuest. And that really kind of continued to expand my, my career. So what sort of diseases or pests were you trying to attack? Well, we kind of looked at a broad range of things. So sometimes you pick up your carton of strawberries from your refrigerator and you see some fuzzy stuff coming out of some of the strawberries. (laughs) That's usually botrytis. So gray mold is the common name. And there's a lot of applications to control gray mold when growing grapes or strawberries or, or many different fruits. So we had a range of pathogens or these kind of diseases that we were looking at in the laboratory. And we also had a range of insect pests like caterpillars, like aphids, like lies. In the soil, there are little worms called nematodes that eat up the roots. So those were the things we were looking at in the laboratory, trying to find microbes that we derived, that we isolated from soil samples from the environment that could fight off these naturally. I'm curious, why did you choose this field? You talked a little about finding that fascinating, but going from marine systems to land, was it just happenstance of a job or were you really 
drawn to those applications rather. I know a lot of the people in your PhD lab ended up working for pharmaceutical companies. But yes, you went a very right. different direction. Yeah, it was definitely what you said. It was the happenstance. I ended up following a spouse to an agricultural city, which is Davis, California. It has one of the top ag universities in the world. I did a postdoc there that wasn't really in my field. It wasn't very interesting to me. And then I heard about a company that was going to start up this division in Davis, and they wanted to hire a natural products chemist. And that really piqued my interest. So going into it, it wasn't my goal to work in agriculture. Once I started working in agriculture, I just can't tell you how fulfilling it is because everyone needs to eat. It affects every person on the planet. And the practices we use to make this food for people, we could definitely improve on. We need to do better for the environment in terms of our agricultural practices. And that is working on these kind of microbial solutions. That's what I've dedicated my career to because it matters. It matters for everyone and it matters for the planet. And I'm, I'm all in with agriculture. I love it. I still love scuba diving as a hobby and marine things, but my job is in agriculture. It's, it's interesting that you say that. We've had a number of episodes about various aspects of the food system because really day-to-day -day how we continue to produce food on a planet with more and more people and more and more stressors is going to require some creative thinking. However, most of what I hear about in the food security and agri-tech industry is really about much more intensive practices and using pesticides. How do you navigate and convince people in a world where people have spent their careers developing toxic chemicals to look at the system differently? It's a challenge, one that I've spent a lot of years doing. And I think also important for me to point out right now that I recognize that if we want to produce the amount of food we have to produce for the number of people we have and continue to increase, we are going to have to use every tool at our disposal. Even though I've done microbial natural for my entire career, and these are organic registered and certified and whatnot, I know that we can't produce the amount of food we need to produce by growing everything organically. I also know that most of the world can't afford to buy whatever they want in the grocery store, which a lot of us can. We can be particular and decide we want to buy that, but most people can't. And if we want to have people that live in cities and want electricity and want internet and want everything they want, we can't have all these one acre patches that have a diversified system. It's impossible to grow food that way for people. While there's advances in vertical farming, the only thing they can produce right now are leafy greens and maybe a few fruiting vegetables. We need more than that to sustain society. So I am very convinced that we have to use all the tools. For example, I am not opposed to GM, genetically modified techniques, because I've seen the things that genetic modification can do. And like any tool, it can be used for good things and maybe not so good things. And I, I think that's a really important point. I think people throw all GM in one basket. And a lot of the GM that I have concerns about are the GM plants that are just developed to be resistant to herbicides, and then you get herbicide-resistant weeds, and you're really just narrowing a system. But with climate change and the fact that we depend on so few plants and crops for most of our calories globally, we really need to be able to help plants adapt. Quickly. I, I, I agree with you that the balance between intensification and extensification is a challenge. If we use more land, that impacts biodiversity very much as well, and you lose habitat and you lose space for humans. But it is a very complex issue, isn't it? A it, lot is, of it is complex, yes. You know, people ask me, what kind of things do I buy? Do I buy organic? And I say, yeah, it depends. Sometimes I do. There's certain things I do because I know how they grow them and it matters to me what's happening to the environment. That's usually my, my push. But I've seen standing in Ecuador in a field where they were growing cauliflower and their customer wanted a package that had a purple and a yellow and a white cauliflower. It looks very lovely. But their white cauliflower had a terrible bacterial disease. So they were using twice as much land to grow enough, you know, for, because they were going to throw 50% of it away. 
that's a huge carbon footprint. You know, that to me, environmentally does not make sense. And so I think that that's the kind of thing where you have to think about the situation and like, what is the way we need to make this food as available as possible to people with the least impact and thinking about how are we going to change the system so that we don't need as much fertilizer application? Can we, can we use microbes in order to help supply that? I don't think we're ready to go and toss everything out conventional agriculture. I don't think we can do that right now. I don't know if we ever can, but we can come up with better and better practices, more targeted synthetic chemistry that has low use rates and and better toxicology profiles and supplement that with all of these different kinds of, of tools we have. So your career progression, you're not at AgriQuest anymore. So what happened from there? That's true. (laughs) So we actually were a venture capital funded company for 17 years, which is an incredibly long time for a startup. So in that period of time, I went from working at the bench as a natural products chemist to leading the chemistry group to leading the discovery group. Eventually, I was head of R&D of that group. Probably there were 70 to 100 people then. And I needed to change because of a family situation where I was, again, following a spouse to another city. And so I took on uh, the responsibility of overseeing all the fields that were being done globally because I could do it from a remote site. I was moving from Davis to San Diego, and I couldn't head all the R&D in person anymore. So I took on that role as running field trials with these microbial. And it really takes different skills and techniques Mm -hmm. to see these kinds of things working. So I was really fun. And during that period of time, maybe five after that, eventually the investors decided that they wanted to get their money out of their investment in AgriQuest. And the original plan was to go public, which was around 2011, 2012. So Bayer Crop Science bought AgriQuest and I decided to stay with the big company. Some of my colleagues left because they didn't want to be part of big corporate. And I thought to myself, okay, how can I have the biggest influence on changing agriculture globally? Is it with a company of 100 people? Or if I convince my 25,000 colleagues at the time, you know, (laughs) that this is a really good idea, can I have a bigger impact on agriculture and the environment? So I stayed and I'm still working at Bayer today. So are you changing hearts and minds? Yes, it really takes a long time. (laughs) People describe it as like a big tanker ship, you know, like you just very slowly change course. But once you start heading down, there's no turning back. And the products that we worked on and developed and are really becoming quite mainstream in a lot of different countries. I think we're in more than 50 countries now and having some impact on replacing old synthetic chemistry that is really not good for the environment. And, And so... Yes, it's happening more slowly than I would have liked, but it is happening. Now, I seem to remember at one time you were working on something to that was for mosquito control. Yes, that was another early thing that we were working on. And that was sort of a, a, another serendipitous observation someone had. And mm-hmm. it's kind of sounds crazy now, but it was somebody had reported or in fact talked to our CEO, who was one of the, the people that helped start the company and said to her that they were using emu oil, okay, emu, Mm -hmm. large bird Mm -hmm. from Australia, on their knees and joints because they had heard it was an anti-inflammatory and that they had noticed, and it was in like some Southern state where there's a lot of mosquitoes. They had noticed they didn't get mosquito bites where they were applying this emu oil. So she came to the lab, Pam Marone, she was the name of the CEO. And she handed me the bottle of emu oil and said, work it out, what's going on here? And so I started as a natural products chemist, you know, looking at all these different components and really it was a mixture of things, which often happens in nature. And, you know, we found some repellency. So we never ended up really finding a buyer. So it never really went further into anything, but it was an interesting mm-hmm. observation. And we actually had cages of mosquitoes in the lab. And my boss, who was the CEO, who was also an entomologist, was like coating her hand in it, sticking her like those <laughs> off, remember those old ads and all mm-hmm. we were kids, and then sticking her hand into the cage of mosquitoes. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I was not volunteering for that. I just yeah. did the chemistry. So. I was going to ask you what keeps you in it, but I can hear that in your voice. You love what you do. You've got a lot of passion for it. I, I, I like that. That is true. what's the most frustrating thing? I think the most frustrating thing is that things move slowly. (laughs) 
<laughs> and it's it's difficult to get people to change and to try new things. I would just say the amount of time it takes. When you're in a startup company, you can throw products out there before they're really optimized. And like I was doing this little slideshow put together for some colleagues for next week where I was looking at kind of the, the whole history of this product we developed. Because the first version we put out was not organic certified because of the inerts in the formulation. It was a ridiculous use rate, like 10 kilos per hectare or something like that. And we just commercialized it because we needed to. We needed to have products on the market. And now the version that we've improved over the years is like, you know, half a kilo per hectare, you know, 20 times, 20 fold, you know, better use rate. And it's organic certified. Of course, we did that right away. And, you know, so we could do that as a small company, but big companies won't do that. They want to have it all tied down, beautiful, perfect, because it costs a lot to go through registration and they're going to do it in all these countries. So that's the trade off. Interesting. So really what you're saying is the larger the company, the more risk aversion. Oh, yes. <laughs> now that's interesting because you'd think there would be at least a certain percentage of willingness for blue sky or innovation. And you do have that. You have groups. For example, we have like a whole venture capital arm of Bear that funds mm-hmm. these kinds of like synthetic biology and things that are really not in the core of what we do, but that could be important in the future of agriculture. So it's just that it's more compartmentalized. When you're in a small company, you do everything and you see everything. Mm-hmm. And it's not like that when you're in a huge company and dealing with all of these different license to operate kind of aspects and these kinds of issues. Bear is a company that's been around for more than 150 years. And so reputation matters for them. So they don't want to have a lot of missteps. And that means they're really careful. Working for essentially big ag or agrochemistry, you're you're working in things like climate impact in agriculture and stuff. Do you ever find a resistance because of where you're speaking from? Oh, you mean an externally, like externally, you know, yes. External. Oh, oh yes. Oh yes. I've started getting more involved in sustainability because I think right. our microbial things are very applicable to sustainability. And Bayer has made some big sustainability commitments about reducing the environmental impact by 30%, reducing the greenhouse emissions by 30% on areas that they're working in by 2030. These are pretty big goals. So there's a lot of eyes on that. I was recently involved in this external sustainability council that talks to Bear sustainability group. There was a farmer and there's like different kinds of academics. And, you know, they're really asking like, why are you doing synthetic chemistry anymore? Why aren't you just doing microbial chemistry? And me coming from this career of microbial chemistry, I had to say like, because I know that today we cannot feed people, the number of people we need to feed with the money that they have in order to do that without synthetic chemistry. I wish it was true, but we can't. So there's this, you know, pushback and also, you know, bear crop science bought Monsanto a few years ago. So that definitely comes with a lot of questions and a lot of pushback. It's interesting that in general, people trust scientists more highly than I've seen surveys. They they trust them more than politicians, more than their religious leaders, more than big corporate, but they don't trust big corporate. So the individuals that are working at the company, they're all good. And it's true. Nobody's sitting around trying to be evil that I know of that's working in a company. But then when it becomes the big corporation, suddenly it has a different feel and character. Yeah. So It's interesting because, you know, the journal I'm involved in, the Society of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, makes a big effort to have a tripartite involvement in everything they do. Government and regulators, industry and academia, and tries to balance. But you see that constant tension from reviews we get in papers we send out for review from the journal and, and everything this we'll see this dialogue as if only corporate scientists had ethics problems. And having worked <laughs> in all sectors, I mean, we all have our issues. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, I think I think one of the biggest things that that we have to recognize and that I learned maybe not so long ago was that facts don't really matter to people, <laughs> particularly today. If you look around at what's going on, it's not about facts. Facts will not change people's behavior. What changes people's behavior is emotion and stories and helping people understand 
the perspective I have, you know, spending years working in banana production, knowing that they are applying 60 or 70 fungicide applications by airplane every year to produce bananas for the world. And that's a crop that supports a lot of people's livelihoods. Everybody loves bananas, but it does take a lot of input. And there's only one variety we can ship around the world. And so we should be thinking a lot about if we're going to think about changing and climate and things like that, thinking about what you eat, thinking about not wasting it. These are huge impacts people can have. And telling those stories coming from your experience is probably a lot more influential than just giving a table of data. I think we probably have needed as a community to do a lot better job of listening to people because it's really listening to their fears and their concerns that helps us understand how we need to be presenting things better. I'm not talking about presenting data, but presenting stories about how this changes people's lives in this way, or this benefits society in this way, or some very concrete examples. And I think that's the kind of thing that we need to get back to. But also sometimes listen to those stories. Does that make maybe sometimes make you rethink a product or an approach where maybe what you think of is important is different than what the stakeholders are telling you is important? Yes, probably everyone does this, but you kind of like get into your project and you're running down this road and you've decided this is the best thing you can possibly do. And you kind of forgot to ask the customer, like, is this, mm-hmm. do, you, do you need another fungicide or or do you have other bigger problems? Mm-hmm. You know? And so this works in all different areas, whether it's interfacing with the public or even your own customers. It's like, we need to be more actively listening to what the concerns are and what the needs are to figure out how to help. I've always said that everybody's an environmentalist until they have a cockroach in their kitchen. And often you see people being very indignant about pesticide levels if they can't control them, but still spraying their house and garden and everything. And it's an interesting dialogue to put in perspective those different choices and different uses of chemicals that we want a certain lifestyle and chemicals that brought it to us. Mm -hmm. And so you have to think about what that means, you Mm -hmm. know, it means uglier food or the occasional ants wandering in your kitchen, but it Mm -hmm. also means natural predators in your garden helping you and killing killing some of the pests that you want killed. So I I would love some time to explore with you more sort of this, these trade-offs in pest control, the risks and benefits of integrated pest management, both Mm -hmm. both industrially, but also in our own homes and how how you balance those issues. I mean, do you bring some of your thoughts and lessons home and look at the the way you grow your garden or maintain your household and think what lessons or what framings do you bring to your own life? I think certainly, I definitely do. And I think I've been an environmentalist from an early age before I even got to Scripps Institution of Oceanography with you. I really think a lot about impact. And so I personally do not spray my house with insecticides. I take spiders and if I don't want to see them in the house, I'll put them outside. I know they're doing a good job in my house. I I do have a kid who's terrified of spiders. So that, you know, and that's a kind of fundamental fear that you can't teach (laughs) someone out of. That's just kind of ingrained. When I grow a garden, I try to do pest control in a very natural way. But as many people who do garden know, it's really tough. And you'll yeah. you know, often lose half of what you grow or maybe all of it if you didn't put a net to keep the birds off or whatever it is. And that's the piece that you can't translate to agricultural production because we cannot afford to lose half the crop because we didn't use a herbicide or whatever it is. So in my personal life, it's a lot easier to manage because I only have to weed a tiny little patch, you know, by hand. Mm-hmm. I've put solar panels on three houses. I drive a hybrid car. I, you know, I recycle like an like a nut. My family thinks I'm crazy because I'm digging through the trash and, you know, (laughs) my husband loves that. (laughs) And one of the things I'm excited about is in California, a new law is going to go into effect where you cannot throw green waste into the landfill because a huge amount of methane is coming out of our landfills because we throw away 
table scraps. And so they've started like citywide composting and it's going to be a law now. You Restaurants can't throw food into the trash. So those are the kinds of things that I, I do at home. I don't really like to proselytize. I want everybody to just pick something, just do something that you think will make a difference and do that. And maybe you do a little bit of example setting and see how it your kids pick up on it. And <laughs> that's really the best we can do. <laughs> I think that's a really good point. You change what you can. You live by example. Our companies can't survive unless we make these changes towards this, because if we don't have farmers growing things, we don't have our business, you know, so they need to survive. And so I, I would just encourage people to consider this as a field, whatever area interests them. So thank you very much for your time. And, and a lot of fun. Thanks a lot, Sabina. Thank you. I hope we can have you back and have a deep dive on one of these many topics. I'd be delighted to join you. Excellent. Thank you for listening. Thank you to the rest of the team, Neil McCoon and Anna Gunn. You can find more information about this and other episodes on our website, jointhedotspodcast.com. And we'd love to hear from you on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. <laughs>